Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Dr. Jen Skow, who died recently at the age of 99. Dr. Skow was a Danish biophysicist who was awarded one half of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1997, along with Paul Boyer and John Walker, who were each awarded one quarter of the prize. And Dr. Skow was working at Aarhus University in Aarhus, Denmark, when he discovered the ion-transporting enzyme sodium-potassium ATPase. And we will go into a little bit more detail about that, but according to the website NobelPrize.org, many of the cell's functions, such as those concerned with nerve impulses, muscular contractions, and digestion, require that the concentration of potassium ions inside the cell is higher than outside it, whereas the concentration of sodium ions must be lower inside than outside. It takes a great deal of energy to bring this about. The energy is stored in a special substance known as adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. In 1957, Dr. Skow discovered an enzyme, sodium-potassium ATPase, that serves as a sort of biological pump to transport ions. Before we go back to the sodium-potassium pump, a little bit of biography on Dr. Skow. He studied medicine at the University of Copenhagen during the German occupation during World War II, and in fact, one of his fellow medical students was a German informer. His house was occupied by the Germans during the war, and he was part of the organized resistance against the Nazis while he was in medical school. When he graduated medical school, he became a medical doctor, and he spent his first six months on a medical ward and a second six months on a surgical ward. It was while he was on a surgical ward that he became interested in the effect of anesthetics. Now, in the late 40s and early 1950s, anesthesia was a burgeoning field, especially in Denmark, where there was a lot of cross-communication with the United States. And we talked a little bit about that when we did the Henning Pontopidan podcast. He was a Danish anesthesiologist, which I'll refer you to that podcast. Dr. Scott became interested in the mechanism of how anesthetics work, which is something we're still not absolutely certain about today. But he realized that it had to do with the migration of sodium potassium across cell membranes in neurologic tissue. In 1954, Dr. Scott earned a doctorate degree at Aarhus University, where he later taught. His research on ion carrying enzymes was based on the work of Sir Alan Hodgkin and Richard Keynes, who followed the movement of sodium potassium in a nerve cell following stimulation. The English scientists discovered that upon activation of the neuron, sodium ions flood the cell. The sodium concentration level is restored when ions are transported back across the membrane. This process requires energy. Since transport against the concentration gradient, that is from an area of low concentration to high concentration, and so is believed to require energy in the form of the energy carrying molecule adenosine triphosphate or ATP. In the late 1950s, Dr. Scott proposed that an enzyme is responsible for the transport of molecules through a cell's membrane. His work with the membranes of nerve cells from crabs led to the discovery of the sodium-potassium ATPase. Bound to a cell membrane, sodium-potassium ATPase is activated by external potassium and internal sodium. The enzyme pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium into it, thereby maintaining a high intracellular concentration of potassium and a low concentration of sodium relative to the surrounding external environment. Dr. Skow's work led to the discovery of similar ATPase-based enzymes, including the ion pump that controls muscle contraction. So basically to explain this, in a cell, because there is more sodium outside the cell than inside, and more potassium inside the cell than outside, to create a gradient which is necessary for all sorts of functions, the cell must pump more sodium out of the cell, and must take more potassium into the cell because that goes against the gradient and isn't the natural movement of those ions, it requires energy. And the energy comes from ATP, and the enzyme ATPase is necessary to enhance that chemical reaction. This movement of sodium potassium across the cell membrane is called active transport to distinguish it from the natural movement called diffusion. Active transport requires energy from ATP Diffusion doesn't, and the movement of the ions, three sodiums for two potassiums, is done with the help of carrier proteins in the cell membrane. Here's a brief description of the cell's sodium-potassium pump. Active transport is a type of cell transport that requires the input of energy in the form of ATP. The proteins that conduct this form of transport are often called pumps. 
because they force molecules or ions to move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. This is commonly referred to as against the concentration gradient. One of the more common examples of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. The job of the sodium-potassium pump is to move sodium ions, or Na+, out of the cell, and potassium ions, or K+, into the cell. The sodium-potassium pump has binding sites for three sodium and two potassium ions. After three sodium ions are positioned within the carrier protein, an ATP molecule is split, releasing phosphate. This phosphate binds to a location on the exterior of the carrier protein, causing the protein to change shape. As the protein changes shape, the three sodium ions are released to the other side of the membrane. Next, two potassium ions position themselves within the carrier protein, causing it to undergo another change in shape. In the process, the phosphate molecule is released. Once the phosphate molecule is released, the carrier protein expels the potassium ions into the interior of the cell. The carrier then resumes its initial shape, completing the cycle. Notice that for every three sodium ions leaving the cell, two potassium ions enter. Since both sodium and potassium ions have a positive charge, this unequal movement causes an electrical gradient to develop across the plasma membrane of the cell. A number of cellular processes, including the generation of nerve impulses, use this electrical gradient. I want to mention a unique part of Dr. Scow's work, something that wasn't mentioned in most of the obits, and it has to do with crabs. Most of the early work that was done in analyzing how nerve tissue transmits impulses was done with the giant squid, and a lot of that was done at the Woods Hole Laboratory in Massachusetts. It was discovered in the early part of the 20th century that the giant squid was a wonderful way to study nerve tissue and nerve impulses for two reasons. First, the size of its nerves are very big, as you can imagine, and second, the squid has developed an evolutionary response for quick escape which involves siphoning water and injecting it very quickly, which means its nerves have to operate very, very quickly. We mentioned before that Dr. Scow studied the work of Dr. Alan Hodgkin. Well, Dr. Hodgkin learned how to dissect giant squid nerve cells in the 1930s at Woods Hole, and he was awarded part of the Nobel Prize in 1963 for that work. Here's a brief report done in England in the 1970s describing the work that Dr. Hodgkin did with a giant squid nerve cell called an axon for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize. An electrode was first placed inside the axon by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1939 at Plymouth and by Curtis and Cole in 1940 at Woods Hole. Hodgkin and Huxley first made a plastic cell and mounted it on a platform which could be raised and lowered like a lift. The axon held by the cannula was then hung in the cell, which was filled with seawater and connected to an external electrode. Hodgkin and Huxley found that as the electrode entered the axon, a negative potential with respect to the external seawater of about 65 millivolts was obtained. This was the resting potential of the axon, and although its existence had long been suspected, this was the first time it had been directly measured. Moreover, when the axon was stimulated, the action potential did not simply fall to zero during the impulse, but became positive with respect to the outside, shown by the overshoot of the action potential. This important discovery suggested that the nerve membrane which at rest is mainly permeable to potassium becomes primarily permeable to another ion during excitation. This other ion is sodium, since if its concentration in the external solution was lowered, the action potential immediately became smaller, by an amount depending on the sodium concentration. If, as these experiments suggest, the action potential was dependent on the passage of ions across the membrane, it was obviously important to measure the currents carried by these ions. That work by Hodgkin and Huxley in the 1930s and 40s, begun at Woods Hole and then later at Plymouth in England, was the genesis of Dr. Scow's work. Sure enough, in the summer of 1953, Dr. Scow had the opportunity to visit a professor from Columbia University who spent his summers at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. This was the hub for neurophysiology because of the easy access to the squid and thereby experiments with the enormous nerves that could not be studied comparably in other animals. Scow's period at Woods Hole was a significant experience for him. He suddenly found himself in an international research environment occupied by personalities whose names he otherwise would have only known from textbooks and journals. The problem was 
When he went back to Aarhus in 1954, he did not have access to nerves from the squid. He therefore decided to use nerves from crabs instead. Crab nerves have the same property as squid nerves because they also contain a protein substance with a high level of enzymatic activity. Unfortunately, however, they're not the same size, so we had to use a considerable number of crabs. Scott made a deal with a local fisherman from the coast, and in the following years a distinct odor permeated his Department of Physiology where approximately 20 to 25,000 crabs had to be boiled so the fresh thread-like nerve fibers could be studied. These were the studies that led to Scow's description of the sodium-potassium pump. Now at the time, he did not use the word pump about the enzyme, but in 1957 he published his research in a journal under the heading of The Influence of Some Cations on an Adenosine Triphosphate from Peripheral Nerves. And this was the article that 40 years later earned him the Nobel Prize, and that work was carried out on those crabs. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. What song to close on is a tribute to Dr. Scow, who was the last Danish Nobel laureate. There have been 13 all told, and he's also the only one from Aarhus. Well, I was singularly unimpressed by the list of composers from Denmark, so we're not going to use a Danish classical piece of music, and I didn't like any of the nerve songs but I liked a song with a crab in it. Technically, it doesn't have a crab in it, but it's done by a group called Crabby Appleton. It's one of the great one-hit wonder songs from the rock and roll era. It was done in 1970. Definitely should have been a bigger song than it was. It's called Go Back, and we'll use it as a final tribute to Dr. Jen Scow. Boy, I wish I could play this whole song. You know me so well, and it's not hard to tell when you know